My name is Abhay Dandekar, and I share conversations with talented and interesting individuals linked to the global Indian and South Asian community. It's informal and informative, adding insights to our evolving cultural expressions, where each person can proudly say, trust me, I know what I'm doing. Hi, everyone. On this episode, we welcome back the Executive Director of Indian American Impact, Neil Makija. Stay tuned. You know, as an individual in a somewhat functional democracy, I often wonder what are the most important roles and responsibilities I have. Certainly being a good neighbor, respecting systems of free speech and open discourse, and upholding basic human rights are all part of being a good citizen. And speaking of being good citizens, thank you all for listening to the show and sharing it with your friends, for subscribing, downloading, and rating it wherever you get your podcasts, and for following us on social media at Dr. Abhaydarndika. Now, I think the most basic and important demonstration of our incredible individual power is the exercise of voting. No matter where you live, it's the essence of feeling heard, taking action, and showcasing freedom. A huge part of the ongoing South Asian American story is our representation in the political and policy arena. And with the upcoming November midterm elections in the U.S., it's great to share a conversation with Neil Makija and welcome him back to the show. Neil's a Philadelphia-based public interest attorney and law professor with deep experience having worked both in the White House and in the Senate. He was born and raised in a small Pennsylvania town in Carbon County, went to law school at Harvard, and then returned home to run as a local candidate for state legislature in 2016, outperforming the national Democratic campaign by 14 points. He's now the executive director at Indian American Impact, one of the nation's leading South Asian civic organizations dedicated to helping patriotic Indian Americans launch, succeed, sustain, and grow in American politics. In 2021, Neil was one of 13 Asian American civil rights leaders invited to the White House to advise President Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris on voting rights and immigration. He's a leader and frequently called upon expert on issues of voting rights and immigration. Now, when we last hosted Neil, the 2020 election had just been completed. So when we caught up recently to chat, I asked him to reflect on a not so easy thought exercise about the most pressing lessons he's learned from the past two years. Big question. Um, I will try to tell what have I learned the last two years during the global pandemic and the potential fall and erosion of democracy. Yeah, a um, lot to learn. I will tell you one thing, which is that I'm, I don't think, or I, I don't think I would have ever predicted we are where we are today. So two years ago, one, especially before the election, I mean, I knew the election was going to be close. I knew that the Senate was going to be close. Actually, to be honest, I didn't think we would win the Senate ever. So Georgia was a big surprise. And of course, Indian Americans, Asian Americans played a really critical role in that. And that's a whole conversation we could have. Um, I mean, we basically double turnout and made the margin. That was our big story. But um, there were a lot of difficult times in the first year of the administration, trying to see issues that we all care about get addressed. And, you know, the constant disappointment in terms of the filibuster, it felt like things were going the way that they might uh, be expected to go in such an evenly divided Senate and, um, you know, the polarization, the state of the country where it is, but things have really turned around because, I mean, this president has passed bipartisan legislation on issues that have been unaddressed for so long, whether it's the infrastructure bill, I mean, the gun control, gun safety legislation, the fact that anything happened, I mean, maybe we, we've lowered our standards, there's no question in certain degrees, but at the same time, just showing what is possible. Uh, The biggest moment for me was the climate bill, the Inflation Reduction Act. And knowing that the US is now getting back into a leadership position to address uh, global climate change, and that, you know, by 2030, we'll reduce emissions by 40%. I mean, that's just extraordinary. And, you know, none of that was possible if we didn't do the work we did to turn out our communities, voters who care about these issues, who want to see 
you know, actual progress being made in government to improve people's lives. So that it's amazing. It was, a, you know, it's a roller coaster because for the first year, yeah. it felt like there are a lot of people out there who think, why do we do any of this? Like, right. you know, almost futile. What's the point? Yeah. Yeah. Let's give up. But I think things have really turned around. And some of that is also for, you know, not for the best reasons in that the Supreme Court has overreached on a number of issues of which reproductive rights is one. Um, and that has inspired people to participate. But we're in a very different place now, one month before the midterm elections than I thought we would have been yeah. a year ago. So is the, is the main lesson here just sort of trust the process, be patient? that there's actually an angle somewhere around the corner. I mean, because, you know, truthfully, right, the, the pressure cooker of this is always so magnified. It's actually constantly busting, right? The economy, the pandemic, reproductive rights, climate, healthcare. How do you strategize, especially when voters' attention spans and their capacity to really sort of like prioritize is is challenged and you know from yeah. your vantage point is there is there a way to do this especially now going forward yeah well i think once you do the work of getting people you trust in office and getting officials you know who reflect our values elected you really have to be there for them not only to to hold them accountable but also to support the causes that we care about so you know, I'll give one example. Senator Schumer has been such an incredible champion. I mean, he, he made this happen in terms of the Inflation Reduction Act. And the president has basically said that he is someone who is just extraordinary in his ability to not just advance policy and his caucus and, you know, push things through the Senate, but he makes sure to show up for every community and recognizes the strength and power of every community. So, we hosted him a number of times. He shows up at our Diwali events and, right. you know, people kind of, people have fun with, uh, you know, Chuck Schumer just stops by, takes, yeah. you know, a box of samosas and like jets, <laughs> but because he has, you know, a hundred places to be, but that was the night before the bipartisan infrastructure bill passed actually. So he still made a point to show up for our community at an important time during the pandemic and Diwali. And I'll give you an example you know, he appointed the first South Asian judge in the Southern District of New York. He really noticed and cared. And I don't want to gush over the Senate Majority Leader, right. but what I do want to gush over is say, look, Indian Americans showed up and now we're being noticed yeah. and recognized. And that is resulting in progress on so many issues, whether it's our representation, you know, I mentioned uh, in the judiciary, but also, you know, having issues that we care about push forward. Yeah. It's really a remarkable thing to see that. Yeah. You know, speaking of Indian Americans and, and Asian Americans, it's an element that can't be ignored that, you know, particularly in the sort of 2022 climate that's come up, there, there's certainly been a rise of backlash and hate and certainly hate crimes and attacks against South Asians and Asian Americans recently. You know, and given your own background and also your previous work in, in the legal system, I'm curious, have you personally have been affected by this? Not just personally, but but even professionally and in, and in your role right now. How can you reflect a little bit on, in some ways, the kind of rise of, of this negativity and, and those hate crimes? Yeah, well, I think you've really put it well in that you've recognized it as backlash. And, you know, I had a conversation with Andy Kim, the congressman from New Jersey, and we thought about how, you know, there were key moments in recent history, like 9-11 or COVID, where you had hate crimes against South Asians, Asian Americans, and they were broadly recognized to some degree, right? So obviously, post 9-11, a number of hate crime incidents against individuals, but then also systemic matters in terms of policy and you know, you had the NYPD surveillance in the Muslim communities, things like that. And then you had, after COVID, a whole spate of hate crimes against individuals, call, you know, calling it the Chinese virus, right. et cetera, you know, coming from the top down and how that influences people. But what Andy Kim and I thought is, you know what, these are just moments in which it makes 
the discrimination and the hate visible and understandable to people. And they've been mm-hmm. happening all the, the time yeah. before and after, you know, and since. And certainly I had my own experiences, if you're asking about that, in terms of when I was growing up. And I think what's disturbing now is that it's it's not just isolated acts from people who may have you know, ignorance or lack of experience or familiarity with people from our communities, but it's being pushed from very powerful places. So, you know, Tucker Carlson is like... That's fomenting. It's fomenting this. And if you read that whole expose in the New York Times, it'll tell you that he sees the ratings drive up and they have a whole series of segments that they call, I don't know, brown fear or something where they're like, we need another brown fear segment yeah, today, right? you know, and, and that'll drive up their ratings because they want to scare people who quite frankly, never interacted with someone, you know, from yeah. our background and that drives their ratings. And Tucker Carlson brought on one of my colleagues at Penn Law, Amy Wax, who went on and said that Indian Americans hate America. I spoke about this at our summit last year, but I responded to that. And I thought, when I talk to the elected officials who we work with around the country, there's over 172 at Indian American Impact Help. I mean, these these are people who love America and love their communities and are doing, you know, the best to improve lives in those communities. And for her to say that, One just shows that she doesn't know what she's talking about, but also it opens up our community to real risks. So the number of hate mail responses that I got after responding to her in the press was actually far more than I had ever imagined. I I think our instinct in our community is, oh, this is just one, uh, you know, we think it's just like one ops, but really it's, it's much deeper. And there are people in this country who hear her say Indian Americans hate America and they believe it because they don't know anyone or they've yeah. never, you know, questioned that or, or had it challenged. And I wonder if there's just so much calculation to that, right? So that, you know, Tucker Carlson's team is like, well, we got to put another brown hate piece up there. So tomorrow's Nielsen will go up a little bit or a colleague like that says, well, this is a way to advance my prominence in this with this particular audience. In, in that way, right? I mean, we, like you said, we, we just have so much polarization and so much, so much of these echo chambers that, you know, for me, someone who's absolutely committed to my left of center thinking, but at the same time, as I age, I definitely am very cognizant of what that means in the larger context of things. You brought up the federal judges representation piece, and it's been so great to actually celebrate more and more of that, especially like Rupali Desai and Arun Subramanyam and some really mm-hmm. terrific folks providing that representation in the federal judicial system. But the previous administration also brought in a number of Indian Americans. And I guess what comes to mind for me, is there a net value to those Indian Americans, even though some of them were appointees from, you know, the other side of the aisle? Good question. Um, I think we could have a long conversation about this. <laughs> I know. I mean, basically you're asking, what is the net value of Bobby Jindal to our community, right? Like, what I mean, is- in some ways, right, <laughs> yeah. I mean, look, I, I, I can't stand like the, the Bobby Haley's or the Bobby... <laughs> The Bobby Jindals, the Nikki Haley's, and what they perhaps represent. But I can't ignore the fact that, unlike it or not, they are providing a brown, you know, shade and, and representation to, you know, yeah. to that population. Look, I think if I'm being my most generous, I, the, uh, you know, having a Governor Jindal or Governor Haley, right? I, I mean, I know people who have been inspired and worked for them who are South Asian. And that's a great thing. And it's great because we can't expect every community to vote one way or vote for one party, et cetera. Like we have a diverse country with many different backgrounds, ideologies, interests. I think where the line is, is are they promoting something that is going to shake the core foundations of, you know, what our country stands for in terms of inclusion, immigration, and you know, to the extent that they fall in line with Trump and all that he represents in terms of what really is above partisanship. This is not about 
he's a Republican, let's oppose him. This is about, you know, living up to the ideals that allowed us in the first place to come to this country, right? Yeah. If we didn't have the Immigration Act of 1965 that came at civil rights, like none of these people would be here. So for them to not advocate or care about civil rights, voting rights, yeah. you know, inclusion in terms of our immigration process, they're basically saying I shouldn't exist, you know, like I, I, as an Indian American should never have come here. Right. Yeah. I don't, I don't know if that's, I don't pay enough attention to their views and policy right now, Yeah. but if they're in line with a big growing faction of their party, which thinks that the 1965 immigration act was a mistake and that we should maintain the United States as whether it's ethnic or religious, church state whatever you want to call it like nearly uh, right you know like then they don't really know their own history right yeah. so then i wonder if there is that line between both including and representing and going beyond party and frankly just disavowing who you are disavowing that identity disavowing you know what that means in the larger context and and when you now counsel and coach candidates, or I mean, you talk to Indian Americans on both sides of the aisle. Do you need to make that balance and value judgment for Indian American candidates who are running on both sides of the aisle to say like, look, you know, at least from a value standpoint, run on your beliefs and run on, on who you feel you are. But in some ways, don't forget your identity. Don't, don't disavow. Make, make sure that that's a, a big part of, of who you are. And, and that's what, in many ways, I imagine Indian American impact sort of stands for. Absolutely. I mean, I think you can't, I think if you are to be a successful candidate, you have to be able to draw on your own story and you have to understand how you got here, who you are, what you represent. And what we care about is also the country better recognizing who Indian Americans are and what we represent. And so, you know, I think in terms of how we assess and help train candidates communicate that, they don't always have to in a given district. When I ran in Carbon County, I didn't go around, you know, saying, make me the first Indian American, right? That wasn't like yeah. the first thing that I led with. I led with the issues that really matter to as wide a group of people, which was the opioid crisis, access to healthcare, economic development, etc. But I certainly uh, recognized, you know, in terms of my values, the things I shared about, things that I didn't compromise on at all, you know, when it came yeah. to people who would talk about civil rights and immigration, you know, you have those conversations. They may not always be the number one thing that's most relevant to the constituency that you're looking to serve, but you have to be able to respond and talk about them because whether or not you think this is your core platform, People look at you and they see, you know, they see you that way and they want to know, tell me about where you're from. Tell right. me about your name, you know, right. so it'll come up no matter what. And you have to have a way of, of communicating that and what it means to you. You're listening to Trust Me, I Know What I'm Doing. After a quick break, we'll come back to our conversation with Neil Makija. Stay tuned. So I mentioned earlier that maybe the most powerful act of an individual in a democracy is to vote and having resources helps. So I wanna steer your attention to daisiesvote.org, a hub of resources for South Asian Americans, Asian Americans, and allies who want to exercise their right to vote and mobilize their own networks and communities to elevate their voices at the ballot box. Hosted by the Indian American Impact Project and in partnership with numerous state, local, and nationwide organizations, daisiesvote.org is a much needed tool to increase voter turnout and civic engagement in South Asian communities. Go to daisiesvote.org to learn more. Hi, I'm Congressman Raja Krishnamurthy. You're listening to Trust Me, I Know What I'm Doing with Abe Dandika. Welcome back to Trust Me, I Know What I'm Doing. Let's rejoin our conversation with the Executive Director of Indian American Impact, Neil Makija. I'm thinking of your, your Eagles right now. And, you know, it's not just a success for their victories for the quarterback, for Jalen Hurts, but it's also for the people behind Jalen Hurts, right? It's for the offensive coordinators, for the coaches. Do you as sort of a supportive resource when you're reminding people about how to narrate their story? Do you have to sort of design playbooks for each candidate's skill set and personality and strengths? So, or is it actually more formulaic than that? 
I think, you know, the playbook is, is dependent on their community, right? Yeah. It's, uh, it's very much about what are the issues that your community is facing? You know, how can you effectively address them with your own experience? You know, what have you done both in the community and in your, you know, personal and qualifications like in life? What, uh, how, how do your, how, do, how does you bring your skills to the table benefit the community that you're talking about? Do you also have to remind people again, that even with all the national scope and attention that the, that the adage that politics is all local still has a huge amount of value. Yeah, no, I mean, you're for the vast majority of the candidates work we're working with. We have, I think, 40 candidates we've endorsed this cycle. Really fantastic people. I mean, they're all at the state level. So yeah. uh, we have two doctors, uh, Megan Srinivas in Iowa, Arvind Bankot in Pittsburgh. Uh, you know, in some ways, not helping in terms of us trying to fight the model minority stereotype <laughs> in terms of, you know, right. who the records are, who we represent. But they're wonder. I mean, they're amazing. They're yeah. amazing candidates. And they became prominent in their communities because of COVID. Yeah. And they helped guide people through the pandemic and got done on TV and actually got name recognition through that. And now they're running for state house. They both won their nominations. They, they have a good chance yeah. in November. But, you know, for them, it's really about door to door talking to you know constituents and having individual conversations. To some extent, you know, Arvind might go up on TV and it might be a, this kind of big message that can tie into national themes um, yeah. because, you know, you want to capture a wide array of people. But really, the way you change hearts and minds, the way you win people over and, and make them you know, buy into your vision for, yeah. for what the community is, is, is individual conversations. And, and that's what these candidates are doing. This guy, uh, Salman Bojani in Dallas, Fort Worth area. Yeah. Extraordinary. He has knocked thousands more doors than he needed to in terms of the number of voters. Sure. And, you know, I think just talking to any of them, the issues that you learn about that affect people's lives. I mean, sometimes it's, it, it's things that you certainly are not going to pull or ask someone about, but it's their relationship with a state agency or in Philadelphia. I remember knocking on a door once and this guy's like the garbage truck keeps driving on my sidewalk and cracking it. And then they have to come and refix it every time. And they just need somebody who can talk to government and say, Hey, can you pay attention to this issue in my community? And they just want someone who's going to do that. You, you know, know? We, we had after Bureval on back in January and something he said, which was just so true is just like potholes don't get fixed by Democrats and Republicans. They get fixed by people on the ground doing the work. And that just, you know, it seems like that's, that's so true for all the folks um, that are out there. Yeah. That's cool. a LaGuardia quote. Aftab right? stealing from Fiorell and LaGuardia. <laughs> so, it know, all comes I, back. I'm pretty sure it's a LaGuardia. <laughs> is, that the, is that the I-95 <laughs> bias coming back, uh, <laughs> taking it away from the Midwest and the heartland? <laughs> No, no Democratic or Republican way to fix the pothole. I, th I believe it's, you know, we could go. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and, you know, even speaking of the, the, the playbook versus catering to each candidate thing, you know, the idea I imagine is, is that there isn't just sort of a, a swath of, hey, you know, they're an Indian American candidate or they're a South Asian American candidate. Here's how you should run a campaign. It still has to go back to what they're dealing with at their local issues and and with their local constituents that they're trying to represent. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it, it's really dependent on where you are. There are some races where I think you really can lean in. And, and for example, I mean, Ro Khanna represents an Asian American district. And, you know, for him to be the first in San Jose, in, you know, an area where there are so many Indian Americans, South Asians who, who have come there, I think, you can really talk about immigration in a significant way. Many people immigrated to work for tech companies, et cetera, in New York. Yeah. I mean, an issue that you wouldn't think of as a South Asian issue is the, is the I mean, the taxi cab bailout that sure. the city was able to negotiate. Um, that affected a lot of people from our community yeah. who don't usually have any representation. So, I mean, you should talk to Shaker Krishnan or Shahana uh, Hanif, who are on the council now, but... I mean, that's a really critical issue where you can 
specifically run for the community and and i think having your own story and connection to that is very helpful you know every election obviously produces a winner and and a loser what do you tell the indian american candidate who's committed to civic engagement and representation but just lost an election so this is a conversation I have, unfortunately, very often. Yeah. <laughs> so, and it's something that I can speak to from my experience, right? right? Because yeah. I quite frankly got my ass kicked. Um, <laughs> and it wasn't because I was Indian. It was because I was a Democrat. <laughs> right, right. So if I came away from that election saying, oh, it's because I was brown, they didn't vote for me, that I would be learning the wrong lesson. Yeah. Um, because I actually did quite well. And I think a lot of candidates, you have to measure yourself in terms of the environment, how you do, you know, in that environment. So, you know, we did like 14 points ahead of of Clinton and that was something to be proud of instead of coming away thinking like, damn, no one with a name like mine is going to get elected. Um, And so the conversations that I impart on people is one, what did the last year, two years, however long you spent, sometimes it's that long, working towards this goal in your community of getting elected, what did that give you that you didn't have before? So you now have this really intimate sense of the community. For me, it was where I grew up. I I got to know it like, you know, I never would have otherwise, like every street, the conversations you have, you know, what did you learn? What perspective did you take away? And then two, I mean, many of them are then brought into this national political environment where they meet people like me and others who they sought for support. Some of them wanted more support than they got and, or, and others, you know, might've been surprised. And so I try to guide them and say, look, from my perspective, running an organization where we have limited resources and have a hundred candidates to decide who do we endorse, you know, who do we financially support? Who do we do that? You have to then realize it's kind of like I say this with my students too, is, you don't want to be the student who's like, why didn't I get an A? What the hell? Right. You know, you, you want to better understand what were the other students doing that I wasn't? Yeah. And, you know, what was the rest of the field doing? Because when you have that wider perspective, you start to understand, oh, maybe I shouldn't have run for U.S. Senate when I could have run for the state house or, right. or right. state Senate or something a little more attainable for a first time candidate, right? Yeah. Or where I would have you know, had the right resources and that sort of thing. So there's no question. I I mean, a big part of my job is counseling people, including my, you know, I went through my own internal counseling (laughs) of of when you had this big dream of seeing yourself as on the political stage and elected official and it didn't work out, how do you learn the right lessons so that you can succeed? And look, every, so many great candidates, Ro and Raja, I'd love to talk about this, but they lost three times, right? And by the way, Pramila never lost. So it tells you something about different approaches between men yeah. and women in terms of choosing. I mean, Roe went straight for Congress. I think Raja may have gone for state treasurer statewide first. Um, I think he even ran for that that seat yeah. first and lost. So um, Yeah, exactly. You know, for motivations for people, this upcoming midterm election, obviously, you know, there's a lot at stake. And are there some unique motivators now? for Indian Americans and for Indian American voters in 2022 that are driving us, that you've seen are driving us maybe more? And are those perhaps unique or not so unique to us as a community? So I think, you know, we often ask, you know, what do Latino voters care about? What do, you know, women care about? What do Indian Americans care about? And yeah, we all care about many of the same big picture issues. And there are some deviations from that where our community really pops where we might care about something where others don't. One example, by the way, during COVID was global vaccination and pandemic efforts. I think a lot of us had family abroad who, my grandmother is 100. She didn't get vaccinated until, you know, many, many months after we had access to. And that was, you know, just, I think it was written about just the duality that the sure. existence that we have and yeah. the experience that other Americans, you know, may not if they right. don't have that recent immigrant story, um, you know, is really stark. But I think in terms of the current midterms, look, when it comes to reproductive rights, only 3% of Indian Americans think that 
all abortion should be illegal, no exceptions. Yeah. And there are candidates running, like Mastriano, governor for governor in Pennsylvania, who think there should be no exceptions. So he's in line with 3% of Indian Americans, right. yeah. um, you know, really out there. And there's a, there's a number of others like that that just really don't reflect any of our community's values. I mean, these right, you know, really far right wing. I mean, they're not even getting Republican support, to be yeah. honest. Yeah. They're the Cox in Maryland, um, Michigan, similar story. Also, when you see these candidates go on and say that they, you know, would have overturned the results, that kind of thing. Right. Um, right. It's, it's very clear that they want to see the U.S., go back to like a minority rule kind of thing, you know, thing at a very specific minority. And the biggest motivator, honestly, though, is seeing someone from our community on the ballot. So yeah. my predecessor at Impact, my immediate predecessor, Aruna Miller, she's on the ticket, Lieutenant Governor yeah. of Maryland, Maryland, along with Wes, Wes Moore. Extremely talented, inspiring guy. If you haven't seen him speak, he ran this uh, Robin Hood Foundation major philanthropy in new york city to address poverty and he tapped arna for his running mate i recently went down to maryland for them and just seeing the number of indian americans who she i mean she has really inspired through her career in public service impact was a part of that yeah but she was a state rep she was very active in maryland she's an engineer by training that community that she has really built up around her foray into public service is now being activated at the next level because she is uh, she, she's just taking it to you know yeah. she's taking it you're listening to trust me i know what i'm doing after a quick break we'll come back to our conversation with neil makija stay tuned Hi, I'm Richa Morjani, and you're listening to Trust Me, I Know What I'm Doing with Abhay Dandigar. Welcome back to Trust Me, I Know What I'm Doing. Let's rejoin our conversation with the executive director of Indian American Impact, Neil Makija. You know, for someone like like Aruna, who's having a galvanizing effect on the community and has had this kind of amazing story and and gone through Indian American Impact and, and had some terrific public service now and, and hopefully is is awaiting even more public service. When it comes to our community, whether or not that's with Indian American candidates, but what is the perhaps biggest challenge of fundraising? Because I've heard this over and over again that like we as candidates are apt to do one thing and as donors and givers to campaigns, we're apt to do another. Yeah, uh, it's a funny question. My mom... I, when I first told her that I was doing this, I had to fundraise. She was just like, she was like, she just thought it was like the worst <laughs> right. thing. Like, just like because she's thinking of it's she's thinking of you going door to door and selling candy bars, or yeah, or just she's like she's like nobody no, nobody's gonna give a shit to give you a hundred dollars. Like they're gonna right. they're gonna they're they're gonna like walk away as soon as you ask them for something. Like she just just her concept of of that process, which I think is actually common of a lot of people in our, yeah. our community, you know, and this was actually even back when I was in college, like I got involved in like fundraising, you know, like literally baking cookies to fund buses to go knock doors for Obama. Like sure. that was like my first yeah. fundraising, um, in a, in a, by the way, you can, you can raise a lot baking cookies. I learned it. <laughs> That's great. And, uh, I'm not sure if we followed any of the campaign finance rules at that time <laughs> with, with, but, um, but I think, uh, it's look, it's absolutely, it's essential and it's a challenge. People need to understand to reach, you know, thousands of voters, millions of voters, it costs money. You know, this is why brands, like, why does Coca-Cola still spend millions on advertising? It's because, you know, to maintain an image in people's minds of what you stand for and who you are, um, which in the case of Coca-Cola is like friendly polar bears and not at all diabetes, right? Like, right. you know, in order in order to really reach people and tell them you exist and stand for something, yeah. that isn't what other people might think, by the way, it takes resources. Yeah. And 
And so how do you convey to people, you know, why that's important? I mean, I think I ran pre-2016 or in 2016, nobody, like the, the amount of small dollar donors was quite minimal. Yeah. These days when someone's running for state rep, I mean, they're getting thousands of donations online, small dollar. And yeah. that, that has, you know, created this environment and this habit of people, you know, culture of, of giving in the political context, which is so critical and so important because what we're up against, you know, the reason I like identity centered organizing in terms of organizing Indian Americans, you know, community organizing this way is because it's not special interest organizing. It's not, or it's not the money, the, the money that you raise isn't like the fossil fuel in, industry coming in, you know, putting 2 million behind this Senate race, like Dr. Yeah. Oz, et cetera, and hoping that he votes against climate. No, this is, I mean, we care about democracy. We care about inclusion, civil rights. Like I'm very proud to, to organize people nationally to get, you know, resources behind candidates because yeah. they, you know, they can be proud to have that support, but it's certainly a challenge. We deploy whatever resources we can. We get celebrities involved if people yeah. want to show up and have their photo with the celebrity and yeah. if that will make them donate, then sure. <laughs> anything, anything that makes it, makes it happen, right? Well, and in engaging our community is perhaps the first step, just registering to vote. And I know with daisysvote.org, there's a perhaps big push for this. Tell, tell us about how that's working and and kind of, you know, what the what the scope and the, the hope is for that. Yes. So I love that you ask about it. My team has really done an incredible job on that. Um, Sarah and Tahir, especially. Um, Sarah works on our community engagement front. Tahir is uh, he's really an engineer by training, but is, is uh, helping lead our organizing efforts. And they put together this website to to compile all the resources from different community uh, organizations, voter turnout organizations, both from like a language access perspective in terms of voter registration materials and otherwise, but also content that you can share. We just did a big push for National Voter Registration Day under kind of the Desi's Vote hashtag brand. Um, and it's so important for us to work together with other groups to have that reach and develop that reach where we are, you know, like I would love, I would love a young high school student at every temple, you know, for every occasion to have like a voter registration table, like set up and, yeah. you know, register people to vote. Like we, we want to be in the community in a serious way. I think there's a core you know, group of public servants and people who want to be in public service and make it a profession. But I think to take it to the next level, we've got to have deep reach into communities to people who don't care at all yeah. about politics. But, you know, we have to convey the stakes of each election and why it's important um, so that people vote and have their voice heard. And I mean, we did that in a significant way in 2020 and 2021. But 2024 is where I think we're we have much to come and much to be much to be done right um given all of this that we talked about given all the the high stakes and the road that's and the journey that that even you've had with Indian American Impact and the last several years of so much that's gone on what makes today what what makes you optimistic about the political longevity of the Indian American community? Well, one is we're only growing, right? We're the fastest growing uh, community in the country. And the biggest challenge, honestly, though, is making sure that a third of members of our community have a real path to citizenship. Mm -hmm. So provided that we can get that done, it will unlock, you know, a million plus people who are there basically in line waiting to get their green card and citizenship. And I see a path to that happening in the coming years. Like I think there is a bipartisan basis for support. It needs to be organized. And I hope, I mean, there's, there's opportunities in this fear in that I, I hope that this coming Senate election will not see a wave of candidates who are of this mold that we just need to 
I mean, the JD Vance of the world, they just want to cut off all immigration, right? It's, right. it's, um, and I suspect that they don't want people who are here to actually get naturalized and citizen and get citizenship in a timetable. So that, I mean, that's a challenge, but I do think they're still in the minority. I still think mm -hmm. that that group, that really kind of nativist strand of American politics is not taking hold if we do our jobs and if we right. really turn people out. And so then I think that unlocks this possibility in the coming years to see a whole new wave of people getting engaged, including more recent immigrants. And that will help fight more broadly kind of for the values you know, that we're talking about and that believe in. I, I guess I am hopeful because at least, so here's, here's, here's another area where I'm hopeful. I mean, we're getting first all around yeah. the country. Yeah. First ever in Pennsylvania in terms of Arvind, Anna Thomas, they're running for state legislature, two in Texas, Georgia, Florida, uh, Rishi Vega in Florida, Nabila Islam in Georgia for a state Senate seat. She won the primary by 70 some votes. I yeah. mean, people are finally getting represented. Megan Srinivas in Iowa. There's yeah. like, an, you know, there's quite a number. Sure. And it's all the first. Everyone is the first. Yeah. So to me, that means that we're just at the beginning, right? Um, and I mean, the room's super running, the first in that court in yeah. Southern District of New York. So it sounds like at least, you know, the the engagement, the the firsts, the idea that like, hey, this is a this is a growing portion of our American Indian American zeitgeist. That part yeah. sounds like it's been established. Uh, absolutely. If I'm not mistaken, the previous two executive directors of Indian American Impact have gone on to do some terrific things with public service and Gautam and Aruna. Do you have designs on on your own future? Me? You know, David Axelrod asked this question at the end of every podcast. So you're following a good good format. He's, like he had this one with John Legend, which was great. He's like, are you going to run for office? Everyone's yeah. like, are you going to run for office? Uh, but no, I am very lucky. I mean, these... That my predecessors at Impact are just extraordinary yeah. people. I mean, Gautam is so, you know, the, the way that he set up Impact was really just thoughtful and diligent and helped us scale rapidly. And Aruna, like I said earlier in the podcast, I mean, she built an entire community in Maryland that is now activated, that is yeah. Indian American. And I'm really excited to see her win, and we're going to help her with a transition, hopefully. I don't want to get ahead of ourselves. Right. I do feel I feel quite uh, confident about her success in a, in, a, in a month or so. But for me, you know, I really enjoy this process of building something. Yeah. You know, people used to say I, I always felt this, I, this sense that I was fighting to get my seat at the table. Mm. And I think in a place that's not really representative or diverse in terms of Pennsylvania in Harrisburg, et cetera, it's like, let's fight to get our seat at the table. Um, that was the initial thought, but I really like just building our own table, you know, <laughs> you know, that, cause that, that's what I'm doing right now. Yeah. And working with people around the country to give our community a voice in a way that's just a totally different, you know, perspective. And so I'm going to continue doing that. I mean, I, you know, live in the Philadelphia suburbs. It's, it's the most, important electoral place honestly i like to think in the country i stayed home i stayed in pennsylvania because i, I this is the birthplace of democracy and it's also where we need to save it i very yeah. much believe that um but no i have no plans to share other than that i'm continuing to build uh impact and really love doing that well, we'll leave it at that. And we're so grateful for the table you're building and for all the people you're bringing to that table. Neil, thank you so much for everything you're doing. And I hope we'll share another conversation down the road. Absolutely. We will have many, many wins to talk about at the state level in terms of many firsts. So you've awesome. got to have those those elected officials on your show. And we should do, you know, we should catch up after that as well. Absolutely, Neil. And again, if you're listening in the U.S., please register to vote and visit daisysvote.org if you need help. Wherever you may be listening, please stay safe and try and practice some random act of kindness. Till next time, I'm Abhay Darnigar.